Hello, you are listening to So What, a podcast from Canadian Mennonite University. My name is Jonas Cornelson. This is episode two in our So What About Climate series. And rejoice, dear listener, this episode is not about climate science. But it is about climate change. Specifically, it's about talking about climate change. And for those of us who aren't science experts talking to other science experts, focusing on science can actually limit good conversation on this deeply political and polarized issue. CMU is located on Treaty 1 territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I'm in Treaty 7, Calgary, Alberta. And our featured voice today, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, teaches in Comanche Native American territory at Texas Tech University in Lubbock. Being a climate scientist, Dr. Hayhoe surely expected to talk about climate change when she took her job in Texas. Even so, her first classroom experience proved to be an abrupt beginning. You know, for a Canadian, moving to the States is a different country, but then moving to Texas is actually a whole different country. And so in my first semester here at Texas Tech, I was teaching a geology class for a colleague. And so I, I was taught all about the carbon cycle and the role of carbon in the Earth's history. And at the end of the class, one student in a class of about 300 stuck up his hand. And I thought, oh, a question, because every student loves, every teacher loves a question. So I said, yes. And he said, are you a Democrat? That was how I learned moving to Texas, that climate change is one of the most politicized issues in the United States. It isn't quite as politicized in Canada, but it's moving in that direction. All right, with all due respect, though she is from Canada, Dr. Hayhoe is clearly not from Alberta. Climate change has been a hot political potato out here, probably since the time of the dinosaurs. Also, keep in mind that the talk I'm focusing on today was given in 2017, when Dr. Hayhoe was the virtual scientist in residence at CMU. The climate has continued to heat up since then, and our conversations about it, in person or online, have largely done the same. How productive is it to have these heated debates? It's not, really. So what? How can we cool down our climate conversations even as the planet warms? There's a clue in the title of Dr. Hayhoe's lecture, Talking Climate, Why Facts Aren't Enough. If you lead with facts about climate change, one of two things tends to happen. One, people's eyes glaze over because they're not actually that interested. Or two, you get accused of being a Democrat. Here's what happened when Dr. Hayhoe first spoke to a non-university audience in Texas about climate change. I got my first invitation to speak to a group about climate change. Um, It was a women's group at um, a local book club, actually. And being a typical scientist, I started with the science. And then I continued with more science. And then I kept on going with some more science and I ended with science. And from all the questions I got afterwards, I realized that that really wasn't what people were wondering about. Because although climate change is a lot about the science, what people are really wondering is, if it's really real, what are we going to do about it? So the basic scientific facts aren't really what a lot of people are after when they learn about climate change. And really, that's just as well, because the science is settled. And the average person learning it in great detail doesn't do much to change that. But of course, there's a difference between the science being settled and the majority of the population understanding and accepting all parts of it. Dr. Hayhoe illustrated this point with maps of climate opinion surveys in Canada. In all regions, more than 50% of Canadians said the climate was getting warmer. But are humans responsible for that? So most people across Canada think it's warming. But then do you think it's happening mostly because of human activities? Just about all of Canada, except a tiny little area around Montreal, literally, just a little area around Montreal, is the only one where more than 50% of people say yes. Remember, again, these numbers are from 2017, and they have changed since then. But the point remains that most people may agree on one fact, the climate is warming, without agreeing on another established fact, that humans burning fossil fuels is the primary cause of warming today. Okay, I know I said this episode wasn't about climate science, and it's still not. 
because Dr. Hayhoe goes on to say that the wrong way to go about changing people's opinions is to dump more facts on them. So you might say, okay, well then what should we do about that? Shouldn't we be just, you know, giving people the facts? And honestly, about, you know, probably about once a week, I get somebody calling me up or sending me an email and saying, hey, Catherine, would you just go talk to so-and-so? Because if they just knew the facts, I am sure they would change their minds. Here's the thing. The facts will often not change our minds. Why is that? Because the social science studies have shown that our opinions about issues like climate change, they're so politicized and so polarized, often have very little to do with the science, but they have everything to do with basically our tribe, who we're part of, what community we're part of, and what that community thinks. And if you, if our opinions about is climate change real? Should we be doing anything to fix it? If our opinions have that much to do with our community that we live in, then it is so important to actually think, well, what type of communities do we live in? We live in communities that are geographic, of course. We all live in the same neighborhood, the same town, the same province. But we also very much live in communities like our university or our church. So people's opinions on issues like climate change are heavily influenced by their community. It's about values and a sense of identity or belonging. With that in mind, Dr. Hayhoe changes her approach the next time she is invited to speak to a community group on climate. This time it's at Second Baptist Church. Not first, but second. So I went to Second Baptist with a little bit more, not just starting with the science, but starting with why I actually cared about it. Um, because I care about it specifically because I am a Christian. I did spend time in a developing country growing up, and I know how vulnerable people can be to a changing climate. And so I realized that trying to work on issues like world hunger and poverty and lack of access to clean water and people dying of diseases that nobody should die from in 2017, I realized that trying to fix these problems is like pouring all of our effort and our money and our prayers and our time and our commitment into this bucket but this bucket has a hole in the bottom, and the hole is climate change. Aha. Uh -huh. Leading with her values as a Christian, that are presumably shared with her audience at Second Baptist, and sharing her experience with related issues that Christians generally care about, Dr. Hayhoe very eloquently framed why Christians should bother with climate change. The hole in the bucket is also such an easy image to grasp. I think I'm going to start using that one. There's a hole in the bucket, there lies a, there lies a, there's a hole in the bucket, there lies a, a hole. We'll fix it, dear Henry, dear Henry, dear Henry, we'll fix it, dear Henry, dear Henry, fix it. With what shall I fix it, dear lies a, dear lies a, with Did anybody else think of this song immediately? Was it just me? Well, anyway, there is indeed a hole in our bucket. And with what shall we fix it? Well, a good first step really is to have quality conversations about climate solutions. Because whatever we think, whatever we do, and whatever we love, we all can be and need to be part of the solution, as Dr. Hayhoe says here. So as a scientist, again, as I told you, I often started with the science, and then I continued with the science, and then I ended with the science. But now I think it's most important to begin with our hearts. What is it that we truly and genuinely care about? What values, what loves, and what concerns do we share with whoever it is that we're talking to? For many of us, it may be our faith. For others, it might not. It may be that we're both hunters, and we want to make sure that there's a healthy ecosystem there to support the species that we love to hunt. It might be that we are skiers, and we want to make sure that we can pass that love on to our children. Um, it might be that we care about the economy. And that's, I think, where it's so important to talk solutions. Wait, the economy? Well, yeah, the economy. A stable economy needs a stable climate. It's hard to produce and trade things when you're running out of food or fleeing from a forest fire. Those were just a few examples of what kinds of cares and concerns might lead you to act on climate change. And as Dr. Hayhoe said in the Q&A portion of this event, this wide range of entry points gives us a great opportunity to depolarize climate conversations. 
there's no better way to get out of our, our silos or our tribes or our communities or whatever we call it. There's no better way to get out of our comfort zone than to actually talk to people who we might not agree with and listen to them. I've found that by listening to people and asking them questions and trying to understand what their fears are, uh, what their concerns are, what their worries are, and what their loves are. And then when I feel like I kind of have a good handle on what really makes you tick, nine times out of 10, I think you really can, you can figure out some genuine point of connection, some love that you genuinely share with that other person, some concern that you genuinely agree with. And that genuine shared connection is the beginning of the conversation. Then you can share, not from the head, but from the heart, because I care about X, here's why I'm really worried about a changing climate, because it actually affects this thing that we were just talking about. And you know who says that? You know, the, you know, the U.S. military says that if you're talking about, you know, a security issue. Or you know who says that? This business leader says that. Or this Christian leader says that. As many genuine points of connection as we can find with each other, each of those points of connection is a place that we can use to build that bridge, to meet each other on, and then to continue the conversation. Because so often when someone disagrees with us, our first instinct, and even mine still after 10 years, our first instinct is immediately to focus on what we disagree on. And that never ends well. Yes, starting with disagreement is a pretty good way to make sure you'll end with disagreement. And that's why Dr. Hayhoe suggests starting with shared concerns and moving to shared solutions. Often, even though it may appear that we disagree, we can find solutions that we do agree on, even if we're never going to agree on the politics, because frankly, if anybody ever does agree on, you know, with everybody on politics, that's going to be a bigger miracle than I think any of us have ever seen. So what's one example of a solution that just about everybody can get behind? Well, saving money. Here in Texas, it's actually really crazy. We're up to 20% energy from wind. And wind and solar energy in Texas, and as well as in some more southern states, is now cheaper than natural gas. Fort Hood is the biggest military base in the entire United States. It's in Texas, of course. Um, and they just went with wind and solar energy for their new electricity contract because they'd save $168 million. $168 million. Who could disagree with that? Dr. Hayhoe re-emphasized this later in the Q&A. Who is going to say, I hate that an army base in the U.S., like say if you're a U.S. taxpayer, who's going to say, I absolutely hate that they're saving us money? Indeed, Texas does not like taxes, which is kind of funny because if you rearrange the letters in Texas, you can, of course, spell taxes. But I digress. This is a great solution that obviously should be applied at scale. But when talking solutions like this, Another question Dr. Hayhoe often gets is about energy poverty. Places in the world that don't have reliable, established power grids. Shouldn't the people who haven't yet gotten the benefits of abundant fossil fuels to improve quality of life get their turn? The thing is, many of those people and places are in Southeast Asia and Africa, where there aren't actually abundant fossil fuel reserves. But that means those places can skip fossil fuels almost entirely and use the energy sources that are already there and that don't require big central grids. Whereas I'll tell you what they do have a lot of. In Southeast Asia and Africa, they have a lot of sun and they have a lot of wind. So I have this awesome picture I wish I could show you. It's like my favorite picture of a thatched roof hut in Africa with a solar panel on the roof. Because then you don't have to build the electricity grid anymore. You don't have to build a giant power plant and somehow be indebted for the rest of the life of that power plant for all of that gas or coal, which you can't, you can't grow yourself. Rather, you can grow your energy on your own roof. But most of all, most of all, I think our solutions have to be based on hope, not guilt, and on love, not fear. Okay, so when we're talking climate, there's lots of solutions we can point to from Texas to Tanzania to Taiwan and elsewhere too. Those are just places on three different continents starting with T. But what about us in our homes and daily lives? Frankly, I find it a bit depressing that no matter how much I bike and take the bus, 
about 75% of people in the city of Calgary commute to work in private cars as a driver or passenger. My actions don't do anything, do they? The thing is, our actions still do something. That something just isn't cutting carbon emissions on a broad scale. What they do is help us feel like part of the solution, encourage others we know to become part of that solution, and help us get more prepared for the personal changes we're all going to have to make in the years to come. Dr. Hayhoe commented on the impact of one light bulb. Changing one light bulb, you, you know, you're like, one light bulb, putting in a new LED, that will do nothing. Well, first of all, it'll save you about $30 over the lifetime of the bulb, and it doesn't just change our actual carbon footprint. It actually changes us here, and it changes us here. She's pointing at her head and her heart. Taking action changes our minds and our emotions. Because if we feel like we're part of the solution, then we have hope and we can move forward. Whereas when we feel like it's never going to be fixed or I don't want to fix it, that's when we end up stuck in fear. All right, so change out those light bulbs and have hope. Dr. Hayhoe has given us a lot to think about for climate conversations today. Instead of starting with science, we need to start with the heart and what we care about. From there, we can build common ground and share solutions with others inside and outside of our main communities. If you get a chance to put some of these tips into practice, I'd love to hear how that goes. Send a message to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash so what podcast. And now it's your turn. Here are some listener comments on our September episode on science and faith. One person suggested that the question of believing in climate change when the science is clear is a bit like choosing to follow or not follow COVID-19 public health restrictions. In terms of COVID, they wrote, I hope all Christians will want to be on the side of caring for each other rather than buying into the self-centered notion that I should be able to do as I please. Lots of parallels there with climate too. Someone else had a quibble, their word, with Dr. Hayhoe's blend of alarming science and the fear not message of faith. This person wrote, The scientist says these are precarious, frightening times. The Christian says, don't be afraid because God. Soldier on, preach the truth about climate change. But if I am overcome with fear and trepidation, does that mean I lack faith? That my dis-ease is in fact distrust in the efficiency of God to empower? Big questions. I do not claim to have the answers, but thank you for those comments and I look forward to hearing from you this month. Let me know how your climate chats go, or whatever else is on your mind. Thanks for listening to the second installment of So What About Climate. We're switching gears next month digging into the heavy emotions many of us feel when we look at how our world has already changed and what's ahead as the world warms. I'll be featuring an Arasha Manitoba event mainly organized by one of my fellow CMU alumni. Don't miss it. I'm Jonas Cornelson. I'll talk to you again soon.